case, Jan Willem's going to be talking about how Holland, and, and this hopefully will only be a, um, a primer. We're going to try and get Jan Willem back to really go into depth on this, because we need to do this here also. But how Holland dealt with its um, water is a fascinating story of distributed power systems. Jan Willem, I'm not going to try to introduce you. Is that okay? Can you introduce as you go? Because you... The last time I heard Jan Willem talk, I was 10 minutes late to this thing, and I was up tight about it. And he started off with the Galisteo Basin at 70 million years ago, which really relaxed my shoulders. Jan Willem is fantastic. Here he is. Jan Willem Jensen, give him a big hand. Thank you, David. Thank you all for coming this morning. Can you hear me well? Yes. Yes. Should I speak up? Or, or, am I good? Okay. Good. Good. Wonderful. So about myself, just in two words, um, as you may hear from uh, my little twang and this presentation, I'm Dutch. I came here about 20 years ago, and uh, before that I had a life of 31 years uh, traveling around and living in the Netherlands. And I studied landscape architecture at the Wageningen Ag uh, Agricultural University. Um, and I'm basically officially an engineer in agricultural sciences, and in that program, uh, water was of course a central theme, and I've always been interested in water and land and how people relate to water and land, and that's basically my passion, my profession, and um, in a way I live and breathe it if I'm not 80% water myself. <laughs> so uh, that is uh, what I'm going to share here. And for me, it was really a hobby almost to put this together for the Seba Prando La Sequias presentation this year in June in Dixon. And I'm uh, tweaking a little bit uh, because there are, I think, an enormous amount potentially of lessons to be learned or at least to be considered as inspiration uh, for what we might do with our water in the future here in Santa Fe County and maybe a larger area in New Mexico. And that's also how this talk came about, because I've been in touch with uh, David for many years now about issues of natural resources management and governance and the democracy issue behind it. And as you all know, David, he is really focusing on people participation from the bottom up in natural resources management and how we uh, should actually uh, be more responsible and get more responsibility and be part of the governance system. Well. When um, uh, looking at what David has been doing and studying uh, this historical system in the Netherlands, I realized, like, wow, maybe there is a story that he's interested in, and I invited him to come to the Celebrando event in June. He saw the presentation, and I think it sparked something, so he invited me to come out today to share it. So, with no more ado, then, um, an another thing that I want to introduce here is why here? Why do you, do I think that it makes sense to talk about this here in relation to Santa Fe County? Well, I've been working for the last 20 years in Santa Fe County in natural resources management and water management, and I've learned that there actually are uh, maybe more than a dozen government agencies, federal, state, tribal, local, that are managing our water. And it took me maybe a year of studying it in, in depth to figure out who among all these agencies is responsible for what. And many agencies don't even know which other agency takes care of another piece of the water management here in New Mexico. And that's why there are big holes, actually. If you take an arroyo, for instance, uh, who is responsible for arroyo management? Well, you'll find out that maybe four or five different divisions in the city are responsible, and they don't often have a chance to talk with each other. Then there's the state engineer, there's the county, the Army Corps of Engineers. For these agencies all to work together is mind-boggling. Well, the problem is therefore that we actually have trouble managing our water adequately. And we can of course rant and rave how it could be better, but it is a systemic problem. And once I started studying uh, how it's actually been done in the Netherlands, what I learned maybe 30 years ago in school, I realized that, well, that's kind of interesting. Maybe that has certain kernels of wisdom or at least inspiration that could spark a conversation here. And so that's what I would like to do. Um, the follow-up that uh, 
David mentioned is that I've been working also for Santa Fe County and State Environment Department on contracts to study uh, wetlands and water resources um, and to write a wetlands action plan for Santa Fe County to figure out how our groundwater and surface water flows may or may not support wetlands in the future. Well, the, the picture isn't pretty. And so uh, from that angle, I have some insights that maybe we can uh, discuss at later dates and weave into knowledge that other folks have and raise some of those questions as to what it means uh, you know, to maybe collectively uh, manage our water and form some form of a water democracy in Santa Fe County uh, that maybe can help us manage our resources, uh, not only the wetlands, but also our drinking water, and what that means for the larger natural resource and for our, um, our sense of community to do it together. Okay, that being said, then you have somewhat of the context of why I feel I'm here today and from what perspective I'm going to give this talk, what motivates me to be here. So, um, the first question, please press a button and see if we can move this forward. Um, yeah, there we go. So, um, this talk almost sounds like a battle. That's why I've also called it, there are terms of engagement here. And that has to do with the terminology. Because uh, I want to make, sure, make clear uh, how water management and water democracy works in the Netherlands. That's the big overarching theme. Um, but we need to understand where the Netherlands is, how big it is, what the key factors are, and how climate and coast play into that, and what some terminology is regarding the Netherlands. Um, then we need to talk about uh, the organizational management structures in the Netherlands, past and present. And I'll take you through very quickly a thousand years of water management. <laughs> so, not the 60 million that, uh, that David promised this time. Um, and I give it um, little icons here. The top icon with that river uh, symbolizes for me the systems and um, the, the grammar, you could say, that will be the first part of the talk. Then that icon of the windmills is iconic for the history. And you'll see that throughout the history talk. Then that building is one of the oldest uh, water boards in the Netherlands of, uh, I think it's Leiden, and that was formed in, eight, in 1135. 1135. So that building is from the 1600s, but the water board is nearly 900 years old. And then at the bottom you see a miller rigging his mill. That is for me the symbol of change, setting our systems to the new winds. And so that will be the conclusion of the talk. Next slide. So the terms of engagement is first the Netherlands. Well, it is a country uh, really small. It is not much bigger than uh, Massachusetts, Connecticut, and Rhode Island combined, or about one-fifth of the state of New Mexico. It has 17 million people, so a little bigger not even than uh, New York. 40% of the land area is water and agriculture. So the 17 million are concentrated on 60% of that land area, so it's as dense as New York or LA or something like that. And you'll see it because it is, it's very urban in many different ways. Um, then some terminology there. A water board or a water management board is basically a water authority. Um, it is also a local body of government. It is a hydrologic management unit or area, and therefore a community, because the um, Dutch term is waterschap, very much like if you would translate it into watership, which is like the word ship of township, relationship, um, uh, a corporate body, the body corporate in British or Australian English, that is more than just the board itself. It's the community and its land territory. And Currently, um, there are 25 of those water management boards or water authorities in the Netherlands. It started out with more than 4,000 in the Middle Ages. And they have been uh, like Asekias here. They started really like Asekias, and they have been uh, combined over time. And there's still a process of uh, yeah, combination of these water boards going on. And they're very important. They have 11 to 12,000 employees. 
Um, the main functions of those water management boards are to provide uh, a steady and secure water supply for now and in the future, to provide clean water, and to provide dry feet for everybody. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? Just three simple tasks. If you start looking at Santa Fe County, who manages those tasks, you'll find out dozens of agencies at all different levels. In the Netherlands, there is only one regional agency, and they get their guidelines and standards and policies from the National Water Management Agency, which was established um, about 200 years ago, and the provincial water management agencies. But they only set the guidelines, the national standards. And interestingly enough, uh, when the Dutch developed their road system, their highway system in the 20th century, they started thinking, hey, these water boards or these national water authorities uh, set policies and standards very much for canals and waterways and dikes and bridges very much in the way that we need to manage our road system. So the Dutch Waterstaat, the water agency, became also the highway department. They didn't develop a separate one, they combined it because highways, they realized, have to be carried over the water all the time in the Netherlands. Bridges, engineering, is part of it, so why not combine it? Plus, highways shed a lot of water, a lot of runoff. So they are basically, in some way, a water carrying body. So the engineering that goes together between water and highways needs to be combined logically. So at the national and provincial level, the provincial waterstaat and the national waterstaat are water and highway agencies. And they set out the standards for these regional uh, water boards that maybe manage areas twice the size, well, about the size of, say, Santa Fe County. Um, uh, on a watershed scale, on a watershed level, to manage water resources. The next slide. So, then the Netherlands. Uh, it's always confusing, and everybody asks me, what is the Netherlands, what is Holland, what is Dutch? Well, it's all more or less the same, and it has all kind of different definitions uh, over time. The Netherlands is really currently the short word for the Dutch royal, or the royal kingdom of the Netherlands, which, is, um, which started as a republic of seven united Netherlands, really as a federal, federated state, in uh, 1588, and ended uh, temporarily in 1795 after Napoleon walked in, and was picked up as a kingdom again after the Belgians uh, split off in 1830. And uh, Holland was basically the beginning of it, uh, two provinces, North Holland and South Holland, together uh, a little bigger than Santa Fe County, maybe uh, a little narrower almost, but more, more or less the same land area, uh, that are the coastal provinces. And that's where everything happened, and that's where seven or eight million people of the Dutch live. Amsterdam, Rotterdam, The Hague is all there in Holland. And because Holland is um, easier to pronounce and to use, and Dutch being traders, they've just used the word as their trade name. So, made in Holland. You'll never see it made in the Netherlands, but made in Holland. Okay, well, that Hall is interesting because Hall is a creek. And so, Hall comes actually from northern France because it was a dialect for a little creek going out into the sea. But in the northern Netherlands, um, around Amsterdam, Utrecht, etc., the word Hall was also an old Germ Germanic word for wood. And the northern Netherlands were very wooded with elms, willows, and, and, and cottonwoods. And so uh, the Germanic understanding of word hull or holz was uh, corresponding and mixing at some point with the, the French or Flemish. And so that led to Holzland, Holland. Oh, yeah. So it's the land of creeks and, 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 and bushes. And so uh, they were drained, of course, and then cut and, uh, in the Middle Ages, and that led to all the water management later. But that's where the name comes from. Then another thing, canals and acequias. Well, the Netherlands has a lot of canals. Ba basically, 11% of its water within its territories is canals, lakes, uh, rivers, etc. And um, it's basically a, con a constructed channel for the transportation of vessels, for water conveyance, for drainage and flood management, and for irrigation. And then the specific gravity-fed irrigation systems are acequias. Or as we know them here, but they're in the Netherlands, they exist there too. 
And interestingly, the Spanish were there too at the same time that they were here. Hey. So there is a history of overlap, and I'll show you more that the, uh, the water management issues of the Netherlands led to the formation of New York City in 16, I think, 14. And they were, the Dutch were there for 50 years. It was first called New Amsterdam, and then uh, they were bought out in one of the, I think, the second Anglo-Dutch uh, War. And then they recaptured it again in the 1670s, but then eventually pulled out. So for 50 years, New York and Manhattan was Dutch. And most of these people there were uh, Jans and Cases, and another Jans and Case, very common Dutch names. So, hey, but these Dutch have very strange names. And they moved to be farmers in upstate New York. And so a lot of the Brits would call them the Jan Kezen, the Yankees. Uh. Okay, so Yankees are actually Dutch. <laughs> Next slide. Now, then we uh, you've maybe seen some uh, maps of northwestern Europe, and this is uh, the shot of Google Earth of the Netherlands. Um, I'm very Dutch-centric. I put it, of course, in the center. Um, but uh, Germany is on the on the east side there. Denmark to the north. Uh, Belgium uh, and France to the south southwest, and then England and uh, or the UK and Ireland to the west, and then the North Sea, which is basically a large inner sea of the Atlantic, uh, connected uh, through the Channel, uh, going all around the UK and Ireland, is um, basically the Dutch connection to to the Atlantic. Uh, the next one, you you zoom in there. That is the Netherlands, then closer up. Um, 46,000 uh, square miles, um, uh, I don't know what that means, but it is, I think, 200,000, um, uh, no, so 46,000, well, it doesn't matter. So it, it, it is, uh, so it is basically, as I said, as large as Massachusetts, Connecticut, and, and Rhode Island, the fifth of Mexico. Next slide. So, now, water management, how did it all start? It was really a matter of what the Dutch call no sack, a matter of emergency or even directly translated uh, necessity. But necessity it, in English has too weak of a meaning. It comes close to say bitter necessity. It was a war, a war in many different ways. And all these circles um, tell you about this war. And so it didn't start with peace and democracy at all. It started with fighting, fighting for survival, because the Netherlands was a very poor, poor country. And uh, the people just lived there since the Roman times just to survive with fisheries and hunting and woodcutting. And then they discovered that they were actually at a strategic location and they engaged into trade. And that made the difference. But it took the entire Middle Ages to discover that skill of trading and benefiting from that very strategic location in Europe, aided with water. Mm -hmm. Okay? So what was, on the one hand, a threat, they turned into an opportunity, that water. The connections into Europe and the coastal connections to all of Europe, to the Baltic Seas and to the Mediterranean, and later across the oceans. Then it really got traction with this guy here, Philip II. He became king of Spain, um, and I leave out a lot of other things here for simplification purposes, mm -hmm. uh, in the 1550s. And um, he wasn't so inspired by his, I think his father or his uncle, um, Charles V, who was a very benevolent uh, king of Spain. But Philip II had... Uh, empirical feelings. And he probably needed to because the entire world was in expansionist mode. And he started walking into northern Europe, into the Netherlands. And he started building ships, armadas, and financing people who came across the oceans following Christopher Columbus. And by the time that he um, walked into the Netherlands and started for the Dutch the 80-year war with Spain, at the same time, uh, groups moved into New Mexico, 
the same policies that we experienced here with the colonization of New Mexico happened in the Netherlands at the same time. So that brought Catholicism to the, ne to the Netherlands. It was actually already there, but because of the um, Reformation that also was starting, uh, because it was an outlier of the Catholic Empire, uh, the Spanish really saw it as their duty to bring the real faith back to Northern Europe. That was another important um, intertwinement of politics and church that uh, cannot be separated in those days. So that's one. The Dutch, the Dutch didn't like it, so war. <laughs> no sack. Emergency. The second thing was economics. During the Middle Ages, they had developed economic power, like I said. The Dutch ships were all over the world, and so economics were important for the Dutch to start thinking about water. Well, we all know the relationship between water and economics. Mm. Then knowledge. The Dutch became a haven for scientists. The uh, middle, medieval center of knowledge was around the uh, Mediterranean, and there was enormous exchange between Muslim uh, scholars, uh, Catholic scholars, and people from the north. If you w were going anywhere uh, with your scientific studies and, and you lived in northern Europe, at least you had to make one pilgrimage. And uh, if you were not Muslim, you went to Rome, uh, or at least to Italy, sometimes to Spain. And um, that, that was very important. And a lot of uh, Renaissance knowledge uh, came to northern Europe and that was very much put to use in uh, science, math, language, trigonometry, uh, etc., and engineering eventually. So map making in northern Europe, in Germany, in the Netherlands, in Denmark, uh, was very, very important and was grounded in the Palladian ar architecture and in the um, uh, Arabian uh, Muslim uh, mathematics. Then, habitation patterns. Uh, because the Dutch had to survive, where to live in this very wet, wet, wet country uh, was a major issue. Hmm. So, uh, fighting the water and, and uh, dealing with um, yeah, colon uh, settlement patterns was important. So, urban planning uh, was interwoven directly with water management. Uh, military and defense, well, that, uh, I already talked about that. Uh, but I tell you a little more about that later. Water management in the Netherlands is primarily, I would say, grounded in military defense systems. Then lastly, which is maybe equally important, is food and water management. Because uh, after a while, of course, there was too much water, but how to manage the water so that you can start uh, developing the land for adequate food production to uh, support the people in the growing cities was an important thing for the Dutch. So uh, water and food management became very important. And then how to deal, how to contend with climate and coast. That has always been a war until you could almost say today. And so these issues are all intertwined if we talk about water management. And I need to tell this story to basically have a, a, a disclaimer, you could say, that you cannot immediately as a blueprint take a system and say that you can adopt it here and do something with it because it's totally rooted in I'm just saying a thousand years of history with those core themes and this area has a different history so you have to start looking at the foundations at the circles that make it important for this area to start contending with water issues and they may be similar but they're different maybe differently intertwined next slide Let's look at the climate and coast very briefly. Um, 5,000 before Christ, um, or, yeah, so that is 7,500 years ago, just after the Ice Age, that's that picture, uh, the land area of the Netherlands was almost twice as big in terms of what wouldn't be inundated. Uh, the current coastal area you can still see here, but that entire northern part was land and that was pushed up by uh, the glacial uh, yeah, landscape. And so uh, seven and a half thousand years ago, people had a much larger area to safely live. That gradually um, changed for two reasons. Um, the ice caps um, 
went down and more water ended up in the oceans. Also, because the ice caps went down and the Alps were relieved, because that's where a lot of the ice was, gradually the tectonic plate of the Alps um, was relieved and went up. It was no longer pressed down so much by the ice. And a lot of water and sediment flowed down a thousand miles to the North Sea, northwest, and got, set, got heavier and heavier with water and sediment. So it started tipping. The Netherlands is just where my wrist is. Ha <laughs> ha. It started sinking with the tectonic plate in the Atlantic Ocean. So the last 10,000 years, we've basically seen a tectonic shift that has to do with ice, with water, and sediment. And as a result of that, and climate change, of course. But for Dutch, for Dutch climate change already happened since the glacial periods. Nothing new. And um, that led to these changes eventually uh, leading... When I was in school, I learned that 33 to 40% of the Dutch land was below or at sea level. Currently, it's 66 to 70%. So, that means that if we have a major flood, uh, 66 to 70% will be flooded. And um, underwater, with that 50 million people, more or less, because it's mostly in the western part, at or below waterline, that people live. That's what you see there. All that blue, pink, purple is all below or at sea level. The, the, the dark blue is at sea level. The green and whitish is above sea level. Okay, so that is um, that's what the Dutch have to contend with. Next slide. So then very quickly, some, some climate facts here. Um, the sea level rose very quickly in the last 10,000 years, 100 meters per century. And it actually started to slow down in the last 100 years, reached a slow point uh, a couple decades ago, and there are now projections that it actually starts picking up again, probably as a result of the impacts of climate change. Um, the, there are very thorough calculations done uh, since the Kyoto Protocols for uh, entire Western Europe at what, at what the impacts of climate change and coastal uh, changes would be for the Netherlands, and it's uh, phenomenal. Uh, the projected hazard mitigation costs of extreme flooding are at least 165 billion euros, more than 200 billion dollars, uh, and 90% of that will affect the Netherlands. So, we now, then you get a, a sense of the picture, uh, a bit, uh, of how, how serious that is. Um, so that is a, basically a combination of the Mississippi Delta and the Northeast being hit by a flood, uh, like we've seen with Katrina and, and, and uh, Storm Sandy combined, uh, but then in the, in the worst uh, degree that you can think of. Next slide. Oh, and then one thing that I want to mention is a very new phenomenon uh, that you may not have anticipated and that the Dutch didn't anticipate until about 10 years ago when it happened for the first time is drought management. Because climate change is not that it gets wetter for the Netherlands or that the sea level rises. The extremes go up and down. That means that a dry year and the incidence of having a dry year increases too. So, in the Netherlands, when things get dry, there's a problem. Because most of the dikes are from the Middle Ages, and they were built with clay and peat. And they need moisture to maintain their internal integrity. And if they dry out, they hollow out. And all kind of critters start living in it. Muskrats and those kind of things. Well, then you can start imagining what happens if a flood uh, hits it after that. <laughs> Gone. So, drought management, besides the impact of drought on agriculture, and the Netherlands is still the second largest agricultural producer in the world, after the United States, and that's because the Dutch own five, uh, five times its land area outside the Netherlands. All those circles that I drew are now part of the Dutch economy outside the Netherlands. And so there is a Dutch empire that is not being talked about. Wow. But that is based on this water management system. Very similar to American imperialism. Talking about democracy. <laughs> Next slide. So, water management in the Netherlands has basically uh, six phases. 
a pre-1100 phase where it was very locally managed and there were no water boards but local action groups to deal with floods. Then the Middle Ages, late Middle Ages, which was uh, the trade period of the Hanse, where people really started to get organized and in a very rapid period, uh, rural areas, and we really started rural, um, started to get together to manage water for increased population growth and to feed people and to keep them safe from sea transgressions. And within a couple hundred years, 4,200 local water management organizations, very much like Asekia associations, uh, emerged. Then in the Dutch Renaissance from 1550 to 1750, uh, that was enhanced and large lake bed reclamation took place. Um, then you got the Industrial Revolution and gradually the water boards, the waterschappen, were consolidated. Then you get in a phase from 1930 to 2000 where there was major shoreline reclamation and delta works where uh, tens of thousands of um, acres hundreds of thousands almost, because you have to, tens of thousands of hectares, were uh, reclaimed from the ocean. Um, and then uh, we're now in a phase uh, of the 21st century where the management of water looks much more forward uh, and is collaborative at a European level. Um, let's move forward here, given the time. So very quickly about this history, uh, Initially, people started living and were able to live in the Netherlands because they, uh, and most of the people, ironically or very strangely, lived in the coastal area where we would think you couldn't live. But these islands gave them some level of protection and they could go out to sea to, to fish and uh, develop trade relationships and they were relatively safe against uh, invasions from um, Gallo-Romanic tribes from, from the mainland. And so a lot of population uh, concentration started on little islands that were permanently or temporarily surrounded with water. And they gradually created mounds uh, on which they started then building churches. And these mounds were called terps or weirds. And uh, you see it, uh, they're often maybe a hundred yards across. Uh, the larger ones are several hundred yards across. And they had a circle of farms around it. And then um, more uh, farms were gradually uh, built on higher ridges or little islands surrounding these central turps. And you have them from, um, uh, yeah, basically along the entire coastline, uh, but mostly in the northern parts called Friesland and all the way up to Denmark. Um, and he, but even here, an old map uh, of the 1200s shows you how even just northwest of Amsterdam, there were... Uh, Here's the sea with the dunes, then an inner uh, lagoon, some more dunes, and then uh, flatland that was actually um, dried up, but the, the, the higher areas were where the, where the villages were, were built. And that leads then to those kind of very small, uh, sh uh, dense types of buildings. Um, they actually were grounded on uh, loamy cobbly material that was deposited by the ice age there that allowed people actually to even have islands to begin with that were stable and not washed away by the sea. Okay, uh, next slide. Then uh, the Middle Ages, that's, that's interesting. The Dutch really got started to consolidate, uh, but the climate got warmer and warmer. There were serious floods, um, and they really saw a need to uh, organize for water management. Politically, uh, you, you saw the first formation of the Dutch national identity, a gradual incorporation of uh, the Netherlands, the Lowlands, into Burgundy, and the Habsburg Empire, which was uh, Central Europe, really. Um, <clears throat> and then the economics shifted from an agri agrarian to an urban society, and trade really started to happen, uh, because as in Central Europe, population started to grow, um, the Netherlands became a very uh, strategic location for trade, to the Bal Baltics, etc., because trade routes on land in Europe were unsafe and unreliable because all over Europe, water management was a problem. Inland in Europe, where it was still very flat, uh, had to contend with major river flooding and marshes and swamps um, f 
for most of the spring uh, season and even the summer and the winter. So uh, then, as I mentioned, introduction of Mediterranean Renaissance insights, uh, flow of scholars to the Netherlands uh, because of the trade development, uh, urbanization, application of mapping and engineering for urban development, and gradually the uh, using of water barriers, the inundation of entire areas as big as maybe the Santa Fe watershed for defense purposes, so that um, small fiefdoms in, say, Germany couldn't walk into Amsterdam to take it over because there was a lot of concentrated power and money. So they started creating already in the Middle Ages, in the, in the late 1400s, early 1500s, these inundation zones that have been maintained until World War II uh, as major defense lines. Currently, they are recreation lakes and uh, archaeological sites, but it, they, uh, they're, they're still there. And then because of um, population growth, it was really important to start reclaiming some land, um, and that's when all these water boards started to happen, and the population uh, rose to over a million people in, um, in 400 years' time. Next slide. So this is an example of these first reclamations, uh, for instance, near Alkmaar, uh, but also an example of how people had to contend with flooding. And you see the, the typical idea of all these mounds in the landscape. Yeah. That is uh, how these medieval, um, or this must be Jan van Eyck, I think the 1500s, how he depicted uh, how the Dutch lived on that landscape. Um, next slide. Now then, the, the real moment of takeoff of the Dutch water systems were in the 15 and 1600s, um, the Dutch Renaissance. Uh, it became uh, an area where, uh, well, I mentioned already the war with Spain, but that was followed uh, with multiple wars, uh, by multiple wars with England, uh, and Denmark, and France, and uh, mostly because of trade power. The Dutch were contending with the Brits all the time uh, about who was the strongest trader and who had trade relationships and who was um, allowed to do this or that in the world. I mean, to simplify uh, the, the power relationships. But uh, the Dutch uh, had the upper hand until about 15, uh, 1650. And then it gradually started to erode. And they were basically uh, run over by Louis XIV in um, the 1670s, and then the decline started to happen. But not so much the decline in water management that continued and continued. But the population rose uh, tremendously. This was the golden era for the Dutch. It was extremely wealthy. They were with the Spanish and Portuguese, one of the first to go all over the world and uh, develop empires. The first concept of an um, investment corporation was established by the Dutch, uh, as many international scholars admit. It was the United East Indian Company uh, around 1600, about 400 years ago, uh, where they set, uh, sent out ships to basically uh, explore Southeast Asia and develop uh, colonies in Indonesia, southern China, and then later also in uh, the West Indies. And uh, that led to uh, the establishment of New Amsterdam, which is now New York, and uh, where the Dutch were for 50 years. Uh, next slide. So uh, I just give some examples of the map making, beautiful maps, uh, very precise, uh, the best maps uh, of the world. They had world maps those days. This is only a map of the central part of the Netherlands. But these map makers, and they exchanged knowledge, I must say, with Danish and, and French and, and English. So it was just not uh, only in the, in the Netherlands that they did that. It was international exchange of knowledge. It was very interesting. And those folks all traveled to, to learn from each other. Um, uh, an example of the architecture and how dense it was uh, and how waterways were running through the towns as transport lines but also as sewer systems and, um, and, and drainage systems. Next slide. And that led uh, in the, like 400 years ago, 400 years ago to huge land reclamation projects, areas um, of well, that's uh, a, a square mile and a half. So we have uh, about 20, so 30 square miles being uh, reclaimed uh, from inner lagoons and seas in the Netherlands for uh, food production. Because the concentration of people in Amsterdam 
which had grown to several hundreds of thousands of people and for a short period of time was the largest city in the world, um, uh, next to Paris and, and, and some Mediterranean towns, uh, was enormous. So in this uh, landscape, it was very important to produce food. And uh, then the trade from the East Indies and the West Indies had to be accommodated. Uh, and uh, so a lot of produce or products that came from there had to be tested. And uh, that's why a lot of these developments uh, happened. But they, and that's an interesting thing, they were financed by individual capital. It was the merchants of Amsterdam and Rotterdam who saw the need to um, support the wealth of the nation uh, by investing in land reclamation. And that was mediated by government. So it was local government, national government, city government, and the merchants who came to uh, agreements. And a period of reaching agreement could take decades before the financing and the reclamation plan and the engineering all had come together and led to these lake bed uh, reclamation programs. And then within three, four years, they were pumped uh, out with all the beautiful windmills and uh, another three, four years of soil reclamation made the soil ready then for food production. And that led to beautiful architecture, urban, uh, new types of urban development, farmstead production. Those farms are from the, the late 1600s. And so, very, very sophisticated already in, in those days. Um, with separation from animals and people for sanitary reasons and all those kind of things. Uh, water management immediately from the, the farm, so that basically the old idea of a turp, you can still see in how that house is being built, is slightly higher than the surrounding landscape. Okay, next. Then a very, very perturbing period uh, after the decline of the golden era of the Dutch. Um, it became more of an agrarian society. There were a, a lot of um, flood problems. Uh, but in the background, also the Dutch um, state and uh, you could say the Dutch um, governance system was really established here. So after the very rough and tumble empirical period of the golden era, the, the foundation was laid here much more for um, an integrated system of governance where this idea of bottom-up governance through, through the water boards was really taken on and uh, the national water management agency was set up and provincial water management agencies and how they had to work together. and. Uh, in this period, actually, which was uh, very chaotic for, for the country, the water management actually was really put on its, on its legs. And the population rose very dramatically to about 7 million people by 1930. Uh, and the water boards were shrunk to, and consolidated to about 2,800. Next slide. There are sequias. I want to show this. This is water management in the upper, higher parts of the Netherlands. Next slide. Uh, and then the 20th century saw, of course, new population growth, new economic growth, and the need now to expand into the ocean. And, and big lakes and lagoons, uh, uh, inner seas, you could almost say, that were reclaimed um, for safety purposes. Big dams were uh, established. Um, let's, let's move on because there's uh, a lot to say. The population doubled in that period from uh, 8 million to 16 million and the water boards were consolidated even farther to about 56 and you get these very famous images of the Dutch landscape um, outside the big city areas uh, and here these gray areas show all these reclamation projects that happened in the mid 20th century in the Netherlands and uh, the water that is left is now being actively used for of course water uh, management in terms of uh, water level management, but also for uh, recreation uh, and for wind farms and so on. Next. So then the future. Well, the future is interesting because we have again to contend with uh, uh, sea level rising, but also with more international collaboration because after 2000, Europe unified. And that means that uh, now uh, all water management issues have to be addressed um, at a democratic, in a democratic way at a higher level. Well, that, of course, raises questions. 
because basically a lot of water management was bottom up. How do you deal with now an increased level of top down management? And um, anyway, that's one of the issues that, that they are still trying to figure out. But it uh, led also to a, a very rapid further increase of know how computer driven water management systems uh, just of the last couple of decades, but just that has done to water management is, is phenomenal and the scale and the sophistication by which this can be done is now a major source of income for the Netherlands because this technology is, is being exported to Southeast Asia, China, the Middle East, uh, Qatar, Kuwait, Bahrain. They all rely on Dutch engineering firms, uh, water management firms to build their, their airports, their harbors, their foundations for skyscrapers, their water treatment systems, desalinization plants, um, waste management sites, because waste is then being treated, being impounded in uh, artificial islands off the coast, on which then new cities are being built. Nothing new, Boston was built like that too. But that is actually, uh, and that has been going on now for several decades, and that's how uh, a lot of this technology that was again a, a challenge for the Netherlands also financially is turned into an asset. The Dutch are exporting all this stuff and that is one of the major um, income sources for, for the Netherlands right now. Like the food that I mentioned, five times uh, the land surface of the Netherlands is uh, owned by Dutch corporations or the Dutch government outside the Netherlands and countries all over the world including this country uh, where uh, it's being flown to Amsterdam, auctioned off at 3 in the morning, put on a new airplane, sent out back to Boston, where then uh, seven, eight hours later it's in the supermarket. Whether it's Brussels sprouts or carnations or tomatoes that are maybe grown in Senegal or uh, certain crops that are grown in the highlands of Thailand or something like that, or cattle products in the highlands of Kenya. Um, Monsanto is an international corporation that's also part owned by Dutch. So uh, you need to understand those things. Half of Manhattan is, no, not half, that's a little exaggeration, but a lot of Manhattan, a lot of Toronto, Philadelphia is Dutch territory. It's owned by Dutch corporations, the real estate. So uh, it is a, that, emper, that empire is not only America, and so it's interwoven, and the Dutch play that part too, and it's rooted in this entire system with all these circles that I started to tell you in the beginning of. So, start to understand the complexity of um, when, when you first think, oh, this beautiful Dutch water management system, and then look from a democratic point of view at it, where it is gone. It has, it's a, it's a, it's a double-edged sword. Uh, and that can be a conversation later, but uh, it has also the beauty of, yeah, these Dutch water boards are still there, and they're elected, like, and we go to the next slides for that, like school boards. Oh, uh, this is the last one of where it's going with these water boards. There's 25 left. Uh, I mentioned all these things now about the Dutch um, systems. Let's move on here. Okay, these are the, the big future plans. Next slide. So, because water democracy in the Netherlands, and maybe I need to realize that I need to continue reading another time because there is, uh, there's a lot to tell. Uh, but here, these four principles are really important. What does it all um, come down to? Well, it was possible because already several hundreds of years ago, they figured out that actually, if you tax people, you can get some extra money besides the initial investment. And it's not a taxation like tithing. It's really a taxation that was based on representation. Tithing was only a a way of sucking uh, the money out of people and allowing the feudal lords then to take care of them when it was good. I mean, I'm a little facetious here, but that's often how it went. The taxation system in the Netherlands that was really developed in the 17th century uh, meant that people could uh, organize themselves. And it already started in the Middle Ages, as I said, in the 1100s, where they organized themselves very much like Asequias again. And they paid a tribute to a higher authority that helped them get organized and create dams so that their villages and agricultural lands or meadows were safe from flooding from rivers or the, or the ocean and that they could provide for the long term in their food 
uh, needs, but also in water security. Because at, at the coast, you have an additional prob problem. That is that there is salt water and there is fresh water. With population growth, your fresh water source is being stressed because you get more water pollution as a result of sanitation issues. And then you have the salt water issue. So you have to build more freshwater resource opportunities by managing the land that way. Okay? Mm. So that was another issue that is um, behind all this. So the quid pro quo principle is very important. Taxation for representation and services. Then secondly, the enabling environment. You have to create a capacity that's the kind of the modern word, not only in the community, but also in your institutional systems, in your finance systems, in governance systems, in your legal systems, to allow these things to happen, because uh, otherwise you're mired into lawsuits like, hey, we are often around water, and that's not very productive, and then you cannot start exporting the technology like the Dutch really felt they needed to do. And then the collaboration, negotiation, and consensus part of it is very interesting. Um, that has been cultivated again over three, four, five hundred years, and now uh, has the challenge to export that internationally. And then lately, the last 10, 20 years, space for water policies. The realization came that we cannot fight nature. And actually, I think we all collectively in our life and generation have come to a point that we're starting to realize that the engineering and technocratic approach of the 20th century was fighting against nature. And we've looked in the mirror and saw like, hey, we can no longer do that. Nature is stronger. So give nature its space. Start to understand what nature wants. And that in the Netherlands has, been, uh, has become a very important foundation for water management too. Giving space to that water. And then if you give space to the water, what's of course the economic benefit? Recreation, tourism, um, energy, because you can then put water in lakes and then put a, a generator if you uh, uh, let the, wa the water out of the lake, you run it through the, uh, the turbine and hey, you power. So those things are being uh, explored or for instance coastal uh, generation systems, tidal uh, flood systems and there are experiments now with tidal um, uh, power generation turbines in the ocean. And so that is the space for water policies uh, more, uh, thing. That, and, and they create very interesting programs where now land is being um, bought out along the rivers, uh, basically through eminent domain. And so they excavate the river floodplains. Why do you do that? Well, first of all, the land is sinking gradually in the ocean. You need still, like in the Middle Ages, more dirt to increase the level of your construction areas. So, you basically generate pretty cheap aggregate. Then, you increase your water bodies so, so that when, with earlier and earlier snow melt from the Alps, the water level rises in the ocean. So what happens? The flooding doesn't happen in the, in, at the ocean level. No, the flooding happens 100, 200 miles land inward because these rivers cannot drain their water in the ocean. So, hey, you need to do something 200 miles land inward. So they start mining aggregate there so that these rivers with snow melt have a way to go. Well, so these excavations or these gravel pits are being financed with the revenue from the aggregate itself. And then it's being put into nature preservation and there are grants for nature preservation so that finances it. Then you can put um, uh, recreation lakes on top of it and build entire recreation communities for sailboats and all that, those kind of things so people don't have to go that far to the Mediterranean and uh, you create your own industry so that Swedes and even people in Spain go to the Netherlands <laughs> because it's so beautiful to have a second home uh, along the river on such an island there that used to be just all agricultural land and because they own five times the land surface uh, outside the Netherlands for agriculture, they export it. Why do you, do you even have to do this in the Netherlands? Land is not that important. It's the seeds, the fertilizer, and the technology that's being exported. So the land is no longer that important for agriculture. It's the other assets. Next. So the quid pro quo. Water is not privately owned. It's in the public domain. 
ha, big difference with New Mexico. And that makes it all possible, really. So you don't have these legal issues. People only have rights to use the water, but they don't own it. And then, like here and the states, constitution allows it, you can create local governments that have the right to levy fees, taxes, and all kind of other financial um, revenues to then, in exchange, give services to the people, like soil water conservation districts do, like the Bookman diversion system actually works, and um, Asequia associations, or a county. So that is the basis also for, as I mentioned, the, the Dutch financing of a lot of these water systems. And that leads then to representation of people in a water board. And it's represented based on the type of land use that an individual is engaged in. And these water boards consist of several dozen individuals. They're not small. They're not like a county commission of five. They're, they're, they have many seats. So that you have a broad representation. Um, so there are different kinds of taxations. There is a fixed water system fee for basically general water system management and residential taxes, fixed fees for each resident. Then variable fees for landowners and nature o uh, area owners and managers, homeowners and non-residential building owners. So it's really segmented by the type of relationship people have to the land. And then tech there's a general taxation for water treatment for residential and business emissions into uh, municipal sewers. And then a pollution taxation. So the polluter pays in the Netherlands. Again, that representation. And into ditches, canals, streams, rivers, and lakes. So that made, of course, uh, trading of pollution emissions much easier than it is here. And that was already established a principle many hundreds of years ago. Mm -hmm. So there is no fighting over that. It's just common knowledge to do it that way. Mm -hmm. And that's now, since a couple of years, being man uh, managed in a corporate facility, the loco census, where digitally all this information is being loaded up and they know everything about everybody. Uh, and privacy <coughs> notwithstanding, uh, this is more important for the Dutch than privacy because um, it is through the local census that people now pay their taxes. It's basically the big clearinghouse for the, wa uh, the water boards and the provincial and national water management agencies uh, as the interface on all the financial issues uh, for taxes and fees. Next. So these are the representations on a water board. The built environment, homeowners. The non-developed environment, agricultural people. Residential, 40, uh, maybe now 30, but between 30 and 40 percent of all the Dutch don't own. Or if they own, they own somewhere else, but they rent. And that is down from over 50 percent uh, 20 years ago. Uh, it was very common in the Netherlands just to rent. And um, so there is a, a large residential population <coughs> And so they are basically consumers of, of water and the assets, the amenities that water has. So in the system, um, people felt that they needed to be represented. So it's not only the owners, it's also the renters, the 99%. <laughs> the business and industrial people are represented. The water retention and infiltration um, landowners or people who have stakehold stakes in that, and nature preserves. So people who own a nature preserve, like uh, the Dutch Nature Conservancy or so. Next. So and then, again, the functions that people get in exchange for those taxes, the, the, the quo for the quid, is the clean water, the enough water, and the dry feet. And so clean water means, uh, well, treatment systems, but also e everything else that uh, pollution prevention uh, and mitigation systems uh, that, that are developed, the research, the monitoring, everything that goes into it, that is done here, for instance, by the Surface Water Quality Bureau and, and other agencies, or the EPA, is all concentrated in the Netherlands, also in the Waterschappen. However, the standards and the oversight is done at the higher levels of government. 
but the implementation and the policies, all the policies related to the implementation are all done by, by these uh, water boards. Um, then enough water, providing irrigation water, water security for urban users, 